Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? Hi. First and foremost, Kavi is you. You're welcome, sir. All right. How is everyone feeling today? I like a very interactive uh, summit, okay? So if I ask questions, I actually genuinely want to hear from you. Is that okay? Is that okay? I thought you were youth, so I thought you had energy. Is that okay? Oh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. All right, well, thank you all so much. Um, you know, I get this all the time when, you know, if I'm at an event and then they read my experience, um, and then people say, ah, you don't look like someone that's been to Afghanistan. I always ask, so people that have been to Afghanistan, what do they, what do they look like? <laughs> um, and then there's something else I like to do when I'm in a session, I actually enjoy going around the room to find out more about the people. So I, I usually ask them, like if it's a small class, I would say, hey, okay, everyone greets me in your native language, you know, tell me where you're from. Because I've realized over the years in studying conflicts across Nigeria, one of the primary reasons why there's just so much um, instability across our land is because we actually do not know ourselves. We don't. You know, some of the primary reasons why people fight each other is because of their differences. You're a different religion, I'm a different religion. You say something about our mind, I fight you. You're a different tribe, I'm a different tribe. You say something about my tribe, I fight you. And so that happens a lot. And when I was in Medjugorje late last year, I uh, had a, a, a session, and I said, okay, let me go around the room, everyone greet me, tell me where you're from, greet me your local dialect. And out of all the people that were there, say about 30 people were from Borno State, I got 11 different good mornings, all from the same state. And what you re don't realize, or maybe you realize, is that a lot of these states in the Middle Belt, in the Northeast, the uh, tribal demographics are so different. There are over 400 different languages we speak here, okay? So my little tip or nugget for you on that is let's try and be a bit more tolerant, starting, and that will actually help bring a lot more peace into the land. Okay, there you go, all right. So very quickly, um, I have very limited time, so I'm gonna go very fast. Um, my company is called Work Intelligence Solutions. Um, and like he said, I'm a US military veteran. Yes, I served in the Air Force for over six and a half years. Uh, people ask me why I did it, and I'll be honest with you all here. In America, when people join the military, they join for different reasons. Some want to travel the world. Um, some people join because their father and grandfather and great-grandfather were also in the military. And some of us, especially you know, we shop Nigerians, we join because they pay for our school. 100% tuition, they pay for school. And the Air Force in particular, in America, I've, I've found out since that the Air Force over here in Nigeria is almost the same thing. But they're very, very big on knowledge. They're very big on mind, brain power. They're very, very smart people. In fact, if you ever, you know, people who work in the Pentagon or, you know, in D.C., most of the officers that are there, you find out are Air Force officers, okay? So the Air Force, they just take care of their people. So for me, it was a no-brainer. I didn't go in the Army. I didn't go Navy. I went Air Force. Um, but ever since then, I've been meeting a lot of other Nigerians, and Nigerians who've had the opportunity of living uh, you know, in America, but then who also served in the military. So a lot of times we get together, we work together, we collaborate together, and we try to help. And as we go along, I'll tell you some of the things that we've been trying to do here as well in Nigeria, because we all know the security situation in this country, how is it? It's like this, remember, did you guys remember watching one uh, video about one of our senators? When I was talking about the economy, economy is like this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have a lot of great clients. Again, I'm really sad that the projectors weren't working. There's projectors that didn't want us to be great today. If that was a liar, we'll do what we can. Uh, but we've been opportunity to train a lot of the military personnel, not just here in Nigeria, but abroad. So NATO troops, you're looking at NATO militaries that comprise from European countries. Um, you also have uh, here, even here in Nigeria as well, I do a lot of work with the Nigerian military here. And even in America, and for me, this was even one of the highlights. I had pictures, but you're not going to get to see them. Um, but one of the highlights was, 
I used to be in the military, and then today I get a call, for instance, um, from this same U.S. Army, and they say, hey, why don't you come and talk to us about X, Y, Z, you know, bringing about stability and fighting terrorism um, in, in Africa. And so for me, it really gave me the warm fuzzies in my heart. So without further ado, I want to question, I want to ask you all a simple question, okay? How many of you here are entrepreneurs? You run, you own your own businesses. All right, very good. How many of you would like to be in the oil and gas industry? Yeah, hey, let me see, let me see your hands. Yes, Chevron, X, you like the hands. That Exxon money. And there is a lot of money to be made. Now, I had a video, unfortunately, you're going to see it. But in this video, you see a group of guys with their weapons, and they're talking to the cameraman. And they start singing, here you are, you want to be in oil and gas, you want to be the next Chevron of Nigeria or whatever, and you just want to be pumping your oil, at least helping the community and so on. Some boys have been smoking some, something the night before, decide that they, they want a peer raise. And so you just want to go and do your job diligently, and next thing you hear is some people outside singing, Na my area be this, yo, 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 yo. Hey, yeah, sing with me. Now my area be this, yo, 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 yo. Then the remaining group there, they'll even add also. Now my area be this, yo, 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 yo. <laughs> and that is literally how these things work. Here. There's a lot of things in the environment once allow you just do your job, earn your living, and be going. Am I right? There are a lot of things, a lot of forces that are working against you. And a lot of it is socioeconomical. But I'm here to talk about enhancing security in a business environment for sustainable growth. I know it's a mouthful, so I tried to break it down a little bit. In other words, if you want sustainable growth in your business, okay, you're going to have to learn how to enhance security in your operations. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about. Okay? Um, one of the first things you want to do, feel free to take notes if you want, but one of the first things you need to do is to learn how to develop a security culture within your organization. Developing a security culture. What does that mean? In the military, um, we had our ID cards, and you had to carry that everywhere you went to. In fact, you wouldn't get on base if you didn't have it. If you needed to log into your system, you needed the card. Put it in there as a card reader. That's the first authentication, and then before you put in your password. Okay, so there was a general security culture. Not just even there. You know, countries like uh, the Bahamas, Barbados, all these countries, you know, one of their primary economies is what? Tourism, right? So the locals, the young, from when they're young like this, they train them, they learn to be nice to foreigners, anybody on their land, because that's how they eat. Now, in a country like Israel, from like this, they learn that you're surrounded by your enemies. When they get to like this, oh yeah, mandatory, everybody join the military. Did you know that? Yes. So what does that mean? It means that when you're on a bus in Israel and you forget your bag, one random person will pull you back, okay? You forget your bag. It's not this bus, they're going to blow up. They have a security consciousness all around, okay? So this is what we mean to develop a security culture. You have to let everyone be constantly aware of the security situation and just put in simple practices that will help secure your area. So I have two strategies for this, okay? I've broken it down into two. Obviously there are a lot more, but I think this two should be pretty good for you. Number one is implement security measures, okay? Implement security measures in your companies, in your, in your little startups. And number two is develop a disaster plan. All right. Now, one of the first things you need to know is what are the security threats in the area where you are, your location. Nigeria is experiencing a lot of different issues and it varies depending on where you are in the country. You have terrorism in what part of the country? What part? Not just north. What parts? Not just northeast. What parts? Hey, you need to understand. So when someone comes and tells you, yeah, they have a big hectare of land for farming that they have, and you can come and start your farm there, we just pack your portmanteau and be going. Okay. Next is civil unrest. There are a lot of protests. I talked about this first. Communal clashes, land boundary disputes. In fact, there was this one. I think it was an Imo state, and this land, this family owned this land. All of a sudden, they found oil 
that they started fighting. Because the people who were the original owners of the land came to say that what? It's their own land. So you see a lot of this resource fighting. In fact, even right now, you guys hear a lot about what's going on in Zamfara, right? Sokoto, all these places. Do you know that one day they woke up in Sokoto and they saw some people from Mali that just showed up overnight? Can your mind even fathom that? Border security, it's a problem. Yesterday there were reports in Ogun State shooting. There's a community, a border community there. You know all these smugglers, right? Those guys with the, with the vehicles and then the back is this high until they put their eyes and it comes back to the regular. Uh -huh. But usually what, what happens, especially the ones who smuggle vehicles in and out across the border, when they're going in that convoy, and even if they know customs guys are there, they say, look, oh, are you ready? 80, 80 miles per hour or 100 miles per hour, and they're going speeding through, they don't care. If they knock a pedestrian off, they knock you off, you'll be all right. All right? So, so even customs, you know, they get into shooting matches. Some people just die just from being in the wrong place at the you know, wrong time. So these are some of the things that we're dealing with. You need to know. Wherever it is you plan on operating, you need to know what the issues are. What about even here in Lagos? Can some of you help me out with some of the security issues we have here? Traffic, yes. Let me tell you in fact, I'll school you all just a little bit. Traffic robberies increase in December and they increase around the times of elections. Do you know why? Okay, so for the December one, there's a lot of traffic, yeah? We all experienced it last month, crazy. Every year, around the same time, we all see the same thing. It happens without fail, mark my word. And what happens is that in the middle of traffic, you have these boys that take, they use it for their opportunistic criminals. They take a stone, break your window, grab whatever they want, they flee. Why? Because they know nobody, no policemen are in the area. And sometimes, even when they have policemen in the area, like there was a situation that happened, someone got mugged, and when they went to meet the last night people that were there, ah, what's going on? You know, we go for those and say, ah, yeah, ah, Gabriel and his boys are started again. <laughs> okay. And then the other thing about the election, the political rallies, you know, from the rallies, have you been seeing pictures of the rallies they've been having up north in uh, Kaduna? The last one was what, Bono? I said, I thought there was Boko Haram here. See the crowd of people, right? Young boys, hyped up just running on adrenaline, and for Lagos especially, but in other parts, when they leave, they cause a lot of traffic, and the same thing, they take stones, bam, break your windshield, you know, rob you, and then they take off. So these are some of the issues we're dealing with here in Lagos. What else are we dealing with here in Lagos? Armed robbery, yes, car theft, so people wake up one morning, car gone. What else? Break-ins, kidnapping. Thankfully, not as much in Lagos. They fought it pretty hard in the state. And I have to give it to the Lagos State um, Police Command, Lagos State Security Trust Fund, Lagos State Government. They've actually tried. Because despite the 20 plus million, I don't know what number they've come up with these days, of the population here, um, they've actually made it relatively safe compared to other parts of the country. All right, so we're dealing with a lot. Even natural disasters, flood. Do you guys remember the flood? The one in VI, the Rebo man that had a kilo in front of Federal Palace. Yes, and was paddling along. It can get disastrous. In fact, the same way they're saying climate change is bringing the desert closer and closer to the middle belt. That's the same way they're saying one day they goes to just pull inside the water because the water will keep going up and we we'll all end up in just together. Anyway, and then another thing is epidemic diseases. You know, one of the things that my company does is we give a lot of advisories to companies that are coming to do business here. We have to let them know what the threats are, what they're going to experience, and how to mitigate it. What are the measures you put in place to reduce your exposure? Um, and it's crazy because we, we found out that we had to start doing things about disease outbreaks. And in fact, the recent one I was reading, in a state like Baochi, for instance, leprosy. Oh, hands disease, I think is what it's called. But there was a, it made a comeback. Cholera outbreak. Lassa fever, I know that's one of the ones we deal with here. Monkey pox, all these things coming out of nowhere. And we, I, I gave this example once before, but in the military, before we deployed to Afghanistan, we all had to get um, immunized for smallpox. Now, smallpox apparently doesn't even, you would rarely even see it anymore, they managed to eradicate it. Um, but the reason why the military still immunizes their people is because they realize that if you're not immune, and that's the way the body 
um, the, the immunization is they give you the smallpox. So they'll just dab a little bit there. And then it will break out there in the smallpox. But what happens is your body fights it and then you build the immunity for it. And they identify that as a threat even for the troops because all the adversary needs to do is what? Take a guy who has smallpox and do what? Help me now. Send him into the base, send him onto the unit or into the crowd. And next thing you know, there's a smallpox outbreak. And next thing you know, half your troops are dead. All right, so these are some of the things that we all need to keep in mind. They just did really good with regards to um, fighting the Ebola issue. So, number one, implementing security measures, okay? The proper security measures can help protect your businesses from burglary, theft, embezzlement, and all these crimes. All right, so first thing you have to do, remember, figure out the threats unique to your location. Wherever it is you're going to work, figure out what your threats are. If your new location that you have, this, your startup money can only afford you Oshogi, Figure out what the issues are in OSHA-D so you can protect yourself in that way, okay? The next thing you also want to consider are physical security for your site. Physical security. Now, when people think of security, this is what you initially think of, which is what? The cameras, Abby? CCTV, what else? What? Huh? Doors, yes. Bulletproof doors, what else? Doors, I think someone said dogs. Security dogs. Huh? Eh, uh -huh. sure. Whatever you said. Okay. <laughs> it's guards, fences, security doors, locks, access control, right? Alarm systems. You know those, uh, they now have these alarm systems that you can put somewhere and it's motion detection. So anytime someone even just walks in front of your door, you get an alert on your phone and you can check and see the camera and see what they're doing. And it was ridiculous because one went viral the other day and there was one guy that would go to someone's doorbell and just be leaking their doorbell. <laughs> so thankfully they had this camera because they had traveled and this camera you know, tells you that there's someone hovering in front of your door and they looked down and just saw this guy at night just leaking. <laughs> All right, now even for me as a working mom, okay, and entrepreneurs, you know, we work 24-7, right? Work never sleeps, especially in security. But as a working mom, I don't always have visibility on the kids, but this is where investing in CCTV cameras come into place, okay? At least from the office, at any point in time, you can check, see how the kids are doing, making sure nobody's abusing your child at any time. All right, so just things to keep in mind. External lightings and so on. So developing, um, okay, the other thing you want to think of is developing a security policy. Now, this is another aspect people do not think about. But if you're going to run a business, you need to remember this. Develop a security policy. What does that mean? It means that your security guard needs to know what to do, okay, when a visitor comes. Okay. Your security guard needs to know what to do when a visitor comes to the location. They need to know what to do when a vehicle comes. Most of you have been to hotels before, right? Or different places. They know they take their little concave mirrors and walk around. Trust me, they're not. Probably not seeing anything, but at least yeah, for feeling all righteousness. Uh, all right, so you have to put something called you know, standard operating procedures. And if you think about it, the US military is so uniform. It's huge, big military across all the different continents, pretty much a presence almost across the world in every country. And um, but we're uniform constantly. And the way to do that is putting in standard operating procedures. From your basic training, you learn when you're outside, you take your hat off. I mean, when you're inside, you take your hat off. When you're outside, you put it on. Your button, everything it has to line up with your shirts and your belt buckle. They pay attention to detail. Everything is documented. That way, you can expand, you can scale, you can grow. Why? All people need to do is just read. This is the standard operating procedure for security. So indicate the areas where people are not allowed to go to. Um, at visitors access control, we talked about that. Um, and also escort services. Those of you who want to do oil and gas, at some point you'll find yourself in the Niger Delta with some people singing, Na my area be this you. <laughs> but when you're there, you need to understand that you probably need security escorts, you know, especially depending on the value of the individual. If you, by that time, by the time they're giving you uh, funding, one million dollars, say amen. Yes, that's a lot of money. Um, and you know that if they abduct you, 
if they kidnap you, the kidnappers have no problem asking for at least 250 out of that your 350. And they're very savvy these days. I'll tell you some of the tips, uh, trends rather that we've seen. Nowadays, the kidnappers will take your phone, they take your iPads, they actually check it, they look for your alerts, okay? So if you don't delete your alerts, maybe now is a good time to make sure you're doing that. They, so they look, they see your alert, they get a, an idea of how much you're worth, okay? Another thing is they actually look you up and down. So we've had that quite a few times. When they stop a group of people, they will actually tell everybody to come out and they look them up and down and figure out hmm, who can pay ransom. So. <laughs> Something to keep in mind and put some measures in place to protect yourself. One of the things that I do when I'm traveling cross country, um, or at least <laughs> to open states, I don't know. Uh, but when you're traveling, you know, interstate, AKT, whatever, and you know that local, they've had abductions here. One of the things I do is to wear something comfortable. Even if I'm going for a party, you always see me in my t shirt, my jeans, and my sneakers. Why? God forbid. God forbid. I know we all say God forbid, but you must plan. So the day that they stop your car, come now, come now, you, ah, yeah, you know me, I look all right. So they'll say, ah, you come this way. At least I have all my tennis shoes. And usually what happens is they take you in the bush and you're going for at least three, four kilometers. Or you may be going for about five hours non-stop. All right? So it also pays to be healthy and work out, just in case. <laughs> all right, so you have to make sure you have security policies. These companies, these Exxons and, you know, Chevrons and all these guys, you know, they have levels. When people are traveling, they tell them, look, oh, if it's, um, you know, expatriates, high level, blah, 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 they have to use this sort of escort vehicle or this sort of uh, security protection. So all the way from your yourself as the founder CEO, which is from the top all the way to the bottom, you must have processes for that. Now, the other thing is um, taking steps to curb employee theft. How many of you know this is one of the biggest issues we have here in Nigeria? I don't get it. And you know, this is what makes people lose faith in religion. Because for such a prayerful country, they sure be stealing quite a lot. People just, and it's not okay. So please, for all the moms, for all the dads, for all the future moms and dads, now is the time to start telling your kids it's never okay to steal. Please. But we experience a lot of um, employee theft. You know, FMCGs, for those of you who's right now, you're only split, um, selling small soap. One day you'll grow. You'll be Nestle. Amen. Amen. Yes, and you'll, you'll be a fast-moving consumer goods um, company, and you're going to deal with this issue of, of employee theft as well. So you want to make sure that you put things in place, or even embezzlement, fraud, and so on. Put things in place, establish internal controls, create an environment that discourages dishonesty. Okay? That's the first thing you do. Next, um, put mechanisms to prevent temptation. You know, I'm going to school you for a little bit about something called being a soft target and being a hard target, okay? Does anyone have an idea what that means? Let me see if you do. All right, now, I want you to answer me this. Where do you think it's easier for an armed robber to rob? Your house or the U.S. Embassy? Why? Why can't they rob the U.S. Embassy? The security is tight, right? So that's the difference. The U.S. Embassy will be considered something called a hard target. That means they have layers and layers and layers of security. Whereas your house will be considered a soft target. Markets, for instance. Remember that time Boko Haram was bombing a lot of markets? Markets are soft targets. Why? Is anybody screening you before you enter? Any security check where you get in? No such thing. So you want to try to make your place um, a hard target. And when it's a hard target, it's harder. By the time a thief has to stand here and choose between A or B, they will always go for the simpler option. So when you make things a little harder um, for them to embezzle, make it harder for them to steal, then, um, then you make some progress in that area, okay? And then um, you also have outside audits, if it's about financing, if you're not sure if your accountant is being funny, occasionally find an outside accountant to just re-audit your accounts, make sure. All right, now the second thing has to do with developing disaster planning, right? Remember? Good. A lot of us, our disaster plan is, uh, what's that? Was it debunked? Some people, na 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 na, some people, na 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 na. Yes, that was your disaster planning. A lot of my death, a lot of my death, but then me, but that's not what will fix and help you. 
it is a disaster, okay? Especially in this part of town, I talked about it, floods happen a lot, okay? Things like that happen. So you want fires, fires are big as well, especially in markets. So you want to make sure you have plans in place. First of all, be aware of natural disasters that concern you. If you're in the east, for instance, they've been dealing with a lot of erosion. Half of the road will just fall off one day. Um, if you're in Abuja, one day you can wake up the tremors. You just wake up, your whole bed is shaking. All right, so you need to make sure you put things in place to respond to disasters. Um, figure out if a disaster happens, what do we do? Bring a team together. Everybody sit down, plan, okay, what would happen if there's a fire right now and it burns everything here, what do we do? You see ideas will start flowing, you realize the need to back up your information, the need to have spare things in a separate site, even if it's your home or something, and then you start putting disaster plans in place, okay? Always think of worst case scenario and then just try to figure out how can we mitigate it if it does happen, all right? At the end of it all, there's a lot more, but you know, time is, is far spent. But I want you to understand something, that no plan is 100% foolproof, okay? So one of the key things, and this is one of the things that makes even the militaries in general get better. You learn, every time you lose a battle, you learn from it, and you get better. So as you go along, you realize, ah, this plan we had in place, not necessarily the best, you do something to change it up a little bit. All right, and finally, no joke, I have here as my last slide that says, last, last, you pray. Abi, that's what we do in Nigeria. After you put in all your plans, after you put in your cameras, your measures, your guard, your fence, your door, your wall, and everything. After, when you finish, what do you now do at the end of the night? And Jesus says, Amen. And you pray. Alright, so in summary, there are two things. We talked about two different strategies to help you enhance your security. First is implementing security measures. You need to understand the threats to your location. You need to consider physical security for your site. You need to develop a security policy. When guests come, what do we do? And everybody needs to know what they are. And you need to take some steps to curb employee theft. And then the second aspect is you develop disaster plans. Be aware of natural um, disasters that are unique to your location. If you have goods, you work in a market, know that fires are a very big problem in our country, especially because the emergency response is not in place. Why don't you consider sprinkler systems, making sure you have your fire extinguishers, things that will help you if a disaster strikes, okay? And um, organize your team together, brainstorm, figure out worst case scenario, figure out how you can tackle that, and um, make sure you just tighten all the details. So now, I'm going to end with a few nuggets. Because at the end of the day, as much as I'm here to talk to you about security, um, I am also an entrepreneur operating in this space. Shout out to all the entrepreneurs in Nigeria. It is not easy at all. So please, a round of applause for yourselves. All right? Um, but one thing I realized is, number one, and if I'm telling you this, I've learned it from just being, like our last speaker said, University of Life. And also, just things I learned from being in the military. Number one, you have to get used to discomfort. All right? Scream if you have to. I don't know if you've ever had those moments where things are just going crazy, and you just scream. And then take a deep breath and continue. I don't care if they think I'm mad. At least I feel better. Okay? So you have to get used to discomfort. You know, if you want you have to have a six-pack, yes, you can go under the knife, but do you think healing from surgery is easy? No. Or you can do sit-ups, 100 sit-ups every day. You have a six-pack. Is it comfortable? Will it get you results? You have to get used to discomfort. Second thing I'll tell you is that no discipline at the time feels good. For all my Bible people, what's the remaining of that verse? But later on, nobody reads Bible here. I'll quote it for you, don't worry. So no discipline, I think it's in Romans or something, I don't know, Google it. But no discipline at the time feels good, but later on it produces a harvest of something, I forget. But <laughs> moral of the story, discipline is not easy. When I went through boot camp, I remember sitting there. I was actually at boot camp on my 18th birthday. I was in Afghanistan on my 25th birthday. I've pretty much gotten used to a lot of discomfort in my life. It is not easy. Discipline sucks. It was painful. You were up at 4 a.m. every morning. You didn't go to sleep till 12 and they hammered you like crazy, but you had to keep pushing past it. 
But later on, today, I fast forward in my life, here I am, holding meetings with generals, telling them how to put their plans in place, holding meetings with militaries across the world, telling them how they can tackle different situations that they have. Why? Because I allowed myself to just suck it up and go through the process. Now, the third thing I'm going to tell you is all a numbers game. Last year, I probably wrote over 100 proposals. Over 100. And as much as I'm like, oh, the truth is, number one, I got better at it. I could shit out a 30-page proposal in two hours. You get better. But then the other thing that you need to learn, it's all a numbers game. It's all a numbers game. A hundred, and it's a, it's the, the math is one third. So you send out a hundred proposals, at least one third will respond, and then another third of that will commit. So let's do the math. A hundred proposals, one third, how many will respond? 33. And then another one third will commit. How many will commit? 11. So if your goal is to get, what, 30 new clients, how many proposals do you need to write? God help you. <laughs> right. Next thing I'm going to tell you, though, is just keep at it. Just, just keep going. I have a friend who was an army ranger. He's an army ranger. And he always used to tell me, you know what? They would carry, like, 100-pound sacks on their back, walking, walking, for, like, miles and miles. And you get to a point where you're numb. Your body hurts, your feet. One guy broke all the bones in his feet. But you just tell yourself, one foot in front of the other. One foot in front of the other. Just keep going. And without a doubt, one break will shine and it will hammer somewhere. Just keep going. Get really good at what you do. When you're good at what you do, people will come and look for you. And thankfully, hopefully, they will find you. Pray, meditate, exercise. It's important just for your own sanity in this our operating environment. And, um, and the last thing I'll tell you is that have your daily goals. Focus on your daily goals and just try to meet them every day. Just, you know what, if my goal today is to wake up at 5 a.m., at least the moment you wake up at 5 a.m., you've done it, you've crossed up one goal for that day. But your daily goals will add up. At the end of the year, you look back and be like, whoa, I did a pretty good job that year. So just take it one day at a time. They say you can eat an elephant one bite at a time. So that's all I have for you today. God bless you and all the best.